Hi, so this is, um, today is the um, 25th of April 2021 and so every week now we've started doing these um, live video logs and podcasts um, from Zimmer and Peacock. So as I say, today's the 25th of April and this is a look back at the, um, let's say, the news from Zimmer and Peacock um, for the um, week starting um, the 18th of April 2021. So um, let me just sort of do a quick roundup um, or a quick comment on the information from Zimmer and Peacock this week. So one of the things that was kind of interesting is we actually put some um, data out about, I just want to make sure that, um, yeah, we put some data out about the temperature characterization of some of our glucose sensors. So at ZP, you know, we have um, a lot of programs going on um, all of the time. And though we, you know, we're fairly well known for glucose and continuous glucose monitoring. It's not the only thing we do. Um, you know, we're also known for kind of COVID-19 sensing. We're also known for lactate sensing. And we're also known for immunoassay type sensors and we're also known for potassium sensors but anyway we do do um, and have very active programs on um, CGM continuous glucose monitoring and continuous glucose monitoring is probably the biggest application of biosensors um, in the world um, and so we do have a lot of programs going on about it so we just put some news out there this week there was some information about the temperature characterization of some um, CGMs that we've been doing, some continuous glucose monitoring systems that we've been doing. So we um, we did some temperature characterization. It's quite nice work by the guys. They had the sensors um, sitting in a constant um, three millimolar um, solution. So the solution is just at three millimolar of glucose, and then they changed the temperature. When I look at their data, it looks like they went from approximately two degrees to 15 degrees over um, really over the course of about 14 hours so they've stepped it up stepped it up stepped it up and it's really interesting the way um, yeah the current increases proportionally with temperature and then in the middle of the sort of experiment let's say they they drop the temperature down significantly again and um, the you know the signal the, the, the signal the signal dropped uh, proportionately as well uh, so that's kind of um, interesting now because that allows us to essentially um, calculate the um, coefficient um, the coefficient of temperature or the temperature coefficient for a glucose sensor so there's two sets of data in there I think they're actually quite valuable data sets because people are always asking about well what's the temperature coefficient for a glucose sensor because a lot of these glucose sensors there's many, many applications for them, food and beverage, um, veterinary and human. And it's human that's the one that's really interesting to people. And so, you know, if you've got a sensor that's um, intravenous, intravenous, um, if you've got sorry, one that's, sorry, um, transdermal that's going through the skin, then that can be at a sort of interesting temperature. Is it at the ambient temperature of the room or is it at the temperature of the body? And then the, that's kind of, you know, there's a sort of, a concern that if the sensor is changing temperature then the signal could also be changing um, as well and this data shows yeah there is a temperature um, correlation and it's actually quite strong as well and what's nice is the guys have actually done it on um, two data sets oh, sorry two types of sensors they've done it one on a wire sensor and they've done it one on a ceramic sensor so just so you understand what that wire sensor is, um, you know, at Zimmer and Peacock, you know, we have these glucose sensing formulations and we put them on these electrochemical biosensors. Um, and the wire sensor is literally a enzyme based um, biosensor that's on a wire and it's pretty good for doing this kind of transdermal work. So here you can see I've kind of pushed it through the skin. So that's an example of the um, wire sensor so in that note that I'm discussing or that data that I'm discussing um, we've put the temperature um, relationship for those wire sensors but on the same next to the data there's also one some on the ceramic sensor so if, just to remind you this is what our um, 
ceramic sensors look like and so now we have the set say the temperature um, coefficient um, or temperature relationship for those wire sensors as well so let me just summarize what I've just said here so at Zimmer Peacock um, like many people in the world you know we are able to make um, electrochemical biosensors and something that we've been asked for in the past um, is what's your temperature coefficient and if you're in an, um, doing experiments where in fact um, temperature um, is potentially a changeable parameter including continuous glucose monitoring on a patient then you might want to know that temperature um, correlation or that temperature coefficient and you can see here um, that um, we have now measured it and people can use that um, in their application so let me come off that page slightly now and also in the same vein um, we're still talking about continuous glucose monitoring CGM you know and as I say CGM is the most uh, or the biggest the most the largest market um, application for um, biosensing and people do ask us well you know I want this sensor to last you know seven days 14 days 30 days well we've been running some of these glucose sensors now for 93 days I could I would not be surprised if these sensors can run for 365 days so glucose electrochemical glucose sensors why are most of the or nearly all of the of the CGM technology that's on the market if you're looking at Abbott Medtronic or Dexcom um, why are they all electrochemical and it's because as electrochemistry is so robust and some of that robustness is the fact that these sensors can continuously work for as I say so far this has been 93 days um, I could suspect we could run this sensor for 365 days and it'll still be operational. Now what happens is in real applications you get fouling of these sensors. You know, for example, if you do a transdermal um, glucose sensor, then you know you've essentially got this sensor in the body and the body does not like foreign objects in it and it has an immune response. It has a, a foreign body response, so it's pretty good at encapsulating and um yeah basically trying to sort of reject um, the sensors so if people are asking you well you know what's the lifetime of a biosensor you can say well the glucose sensor is a really robust example of a biosensor the enzyme is very tough the technology has been in development for um, sort of 50 years at this point um, so you know it's, it's, it's a, it's a well-known technology all this the only innovation in the last couple of decades is really the miniaturization. But so it's not a surprise to me that this sensor um, has been running for 93 days. Um, but that said, if somebody said to me, well, I want it to be implanted, or I want it to be transdermal, I want it to run for um, 93 days, that's a different matter. But anyway, we've been running this glucose sensor for 93 days and it's still running. So in vitro, they are very robust um, sensors, and I'm not too surprised that they are. Um, this this particular glue sensor is still running, so it's kind of nice. Then, so we've we've been, as you can see, glucose sensing is not everything that Zimmer and Peacock does. You know, we have the iron selective electrodes, we have um, immuno ELISA type um, sensors, we have you know our COVID nineteen work, but. You know, we still do glucose sensing, and we still have big projects on it, and we're still characterizing um, these types of sensors. And I'm, um, let me go to the next um, part. So we do have the ZP developer zone. I just got a notification through um, that a guy from France wants to join, which is great. Um, so I will acknowledge that in a minute, but. The reason I mention the ZP Developer Zone is every Thursday, 8 a.m. London time, we do a webinar specifically for the Developer Zone members. And you know the way the, the way it runs, we have a forum. People ask a question in the forum, and um, then we use the webinar that we do 
to um, answer the questions. And so this week, you know, we had um, lots of questions, and you know, we went through them, and, and literally we answered them all. So, and Zimmer and Peacock, you know, we want to support and help um, developers of biosensors across the globe, really as much as we can, within reason, and therefore, you know, we make the ZP Developer Zone 100% um, free. We also make the ZP Academy. We put the, we put courses on the ZP Academy uh, and make them free as well. And I think some of the good content that we put there um, on the webinar this week is we talked about actually how is a screen printed electrode made. And the reason we were doing that was there was a lot of questions coming about, well, I want a gold working electrode and a platinum counter electrode. And so we talked really about the economics of doing such things and also talked about the manufacturing process because people will ask us to make these specialist electrodes and say but by the way I want um, 10 or 100 and you know you have to understand that actually you know when you manufacture a specialist product and it's a screen printed electrode you can't help but make thousands so you can't make somebody 10 or 100 you can make them a thousand so we had to sort of you know I wanted to run through all of that and we talked about the workflow of creating a specialized screen printer electrode. And then I did quite an in-depth discussion really about why does that counter electrode have to be platinum? You know, and I did actually, you know, we talked about, you know, what's happening at the counter electrode. Why does it have to be platinum? And then I talked about the benefits actually of having the counter electrode to be silver, silver chloride. So Zimmer and Peacock, you'll see that we often do things that other people, let's say, on the market don't do. You know, we have rectangular electrodes, you know, and there's a really strong commercial reason why we do that. And then we have the counter electrode is often silver, silver chloride, and we don't do it because it's fun. We do it for really, based on over two decades of experience of, you know, what can go wrong with biosensors and screen printed electrodes, and that's why we've chosen the materials that we've chosen. And this isn't experience from, you know, 20 years in academia, it's 20 years in industry and business. Um, we, so yes, we, we, we did a big discussion um, last week. We also, somebody asked us, well, you know, do I have to pre-treat um, screen printer electrodes before using them? And the answer is if it's gold, it's probably a good idea because gold is actually really quite good at absorbing molecules from the atmosphere and tarnishing. So we did um, cover that um, in the webinar this week. And we also, uh, had some questions coming in from Vietnam um, regarding uh, glucose activation solution for things like just how do we ship and I, I just wanted to highlight it was kind of you know one of the slides we put out there this week is it's at ZP we have a very international team and um, I mean at least you know four of the team members were happen to be from Vietnam they're living in Norway but they happen to be from Vietnam so anyway, we discussed um, also how to activate electrodes to make them into glucose sensors. And I also introduced um, a concept called the barrier layer, which is important um, when dealing with enzyme sensors, um, and in particular, um, glucose sensors. So we discussed that. And then we also talked about multiplexing. We had a question about multiplexing. And um, we discussed some really nice work from Harriet Watt. We discussed that actually we have electrode systems that have nine um, working electrodes on them. And in fact, we've turned all nine working electrodes into pH sensors. So not only can we measure pH nine times, because they're in an array, we can also have a spatial resolution of pH. Um, the question came about because of multiplexing, you know, can you connect to multiple working electrodes at, at the same time? And the answer is, we sure can um, and then we just dug in a little bit deeper and said well, actually we've done this you know we've made a miniature pH sensor and we've managed to put nine pH sensors in this sort of miniature array oh, and by the way because you did that and um, we wrote you know the, the guy from the guys from Harriet Watt wrote some really nice lab view program and we were able to then kind of have this pixelation of pH or spatial resolution of pH so I thought that was um, pretty cool and we covered that um, and many of our multiplexing um, technologies. So that was a pretty intense um, webinar. Like I say, every week 
Um, Thursday, 8 a.m. London time. We go through the forum at, on the ZP Developer Zone and we answer all the questions then from our um, really active membership on that forum. So that was um, a nice webinar that we um, put out there this week. Um, so some further news from Zimmer and Peacock. We have another webinar this week um, on the commercialization of biosensors. And this webinar, um, if you want to access it, hopefully you can find your way into our news section on our website. Um, because the webinar is actually being an, it's taking place at about 9 a.m. Jakarta time in Indonesia which translates as 3 a.m. London time, so it's pretty early, and 4 a.m. European time. So I'm not expecting many people from Europe um, to attend, definitely not. But if you're in Asia, um, just check out a link on the ZP um, website. It's also, we've also put it out on LinkedIn as well. So it's called Biosensors for Veterinary Diagnosis Application. Um, it's organized um, by some of the members of the ZP Developer Zone. We've been um, honored to be um, invited along to give a presentation. So if you're in um, Asia in particular, I think that the time zones work quite well for you. I say Asia and Aust Australia as well and New Zealand, it will work quite well. So that's a webinar that we're doing this week, um, Tuesday the 27th of April. Um, I think it's 9 a.m. Jakarta time and 3 a.m. London time. So I should look forward to getting up early for that. Um, something else we just put out there this week. I mean, we've got some really strong scientists um, at ZP and we're, we're generally honored to have these people and these guys. But we've also got some really strong engineers as well. So some of our engineers, they're just so clever. I mean, it was, in some ways it's a small thing, but one of our engineers, he took one of our screen printer electrodes and we had to make it thinner so it could fit into something. And he essentially just, chipped away all the ceramic material that was excess on the screen printed electrode and essentially just cut this screen printed electrode out um, by hand so rather than having all this excess ceramic he literally cut it away so we had a much thinner screen printed electrode and we could then fit it into a device now i know engineers are very smart people and you know very skilled people but when you do have people like this in your team then it's really quite um you know it's, it's a, it makes for a very strong overall team so we were really delighted with that well at least i was very delighted with it and i wanted to just highlight that and say thank you to the engineers um so we definitely do love our engineers at zp um i just want to remind you i know i said it i did a whole thing about it but we have the zp developer zone it's free to join every thursday 8 a.m. London time, there's a webinar, so I just want people to make sure they know about it and um, come along to it. Um, now, at Zimmer Peacock, we are very, very lucky that there are a lot of people, very talented people around the globe who are extremely interested in joining us. Um, and we're hiring all the time. Um, we've got interns coming all the time. Now, COVID-19 has been tough. So, you know, there are many of you holding out to come and do an internship with us, and we will do those. Um, if you're in the UK or Norway, it really is helpful at the moment because we can do those internships um, because you're already in country. Now, the reason I bring this up is there's another group of people who already got their PhD, and they're quite keen to join us as well. So there's a really good postdoc position come up at USN. Uh, this is... Um, a university near us um, in Norway. So if I just quickly kind of comment upon it. Um, professor Johansson, who is um, um, the professor there, he's really good friends with Zimmer and Peacock. We've known him a long, long time. Um, he's got the postdoc. It's at a university which is in the same town as four of our facilities in Norway. So if you're a PhD, you've got your PhD already, and you really want to get closer to Zimmer Peacock, ultimately maybe even get a job with Zimmer Peacock, it's a good idea to, unfortunately, to get yourself quite close to us. You know, so the UK, it, it does involve getting yourself to the UK and Norway. But this postdoc is a good opportunity. It's on ISFETs, Iron Selective Field Effect Transistors. If you're not sure about them, we did do a, it was included in one of our webinars 
and one of the developers on webinars a couple of weeks ago. So I would really look into um, ISFETs, the postdocs on ISFETs. They say you need experience with ISFETs. I would sort of argue that um, if you've got general electrochemistry experience, that's probably you know pretty good as well. Um, and I would recommend um, that if you're a PhD and or a postdoc already, and you're looking to join Zimmer and Peacock, you need to get close to us. So you, you know, because essentially most of the people that we um, hire have actually been known to us, and we physically met them quite on quite a few occasions. Um, getting yourself to this university is probably a good way in. I mean, two thirds of the people that we have in Norway have at some point been at that university. So um, get yourself there. Um, if you want to use Zimmer and Peacock as a reference, or you want, you know, then I'm, you know, happy to kind of help you with that. Let's say. So definitely take a look at that, especially for you more senior guys with your PhDs already. And then the last thing. Um, for this week is we put some images up um, of you know, at Zimmer and Peacock we're at ISO 13485 business that does contract development and contract manufacturing of biosensors we have standard products so people can just come on the website buy this material and off they go and we do get asked sometimes you know well you know how do I control the quality how do I control the reproducibility of my biosensor in the lab so we're, I put some images up this week because when you see how we actually make biosensors, even if we're just doing um, R and D on them, I mean, you know, these images, you know, so you, when you look at this image, you know, the person's obviously, uh, you know, we've got our hair covered, we're wearing full protective suits, we're wearing face masks, we're wearing gloves, you know, this is a class seven clean room. So we're one of the first things to say is. When we're doing research and development on biosensors, we're not doing it in the traditional lab. You know, even though those traditional labs may seem clean, um, now they're full of dust. There's stuff going on. You know, in those labs, you know, they're not even particularly ne necessarily well temperature controlled. We're doing it in air conditioned, clean rooms where we're fully protecting the biosensor from ourselves, essentially. So when you look at the image on the website that I've put up there. There's a few things you notice here. How well protected the engineer and scientist is here in terms of all the PPE that they're wearing, the way that they're handling the biosensor, they mean they're using tweezers. You notice that she's sitting in front of a 10 channel impedance spectroscopy equipment. So we're not running we're not running one sensor at a time or two sensors at a time or three sensors at a time. No, we're running 10 impedance sensors or impedance spectroscopy sensors at a time um, because we need the numbers you know we need to know you know the statistical significance of what we're saying or proving and so that's you know it's an important image to show you you know the kind of conditions that we work in and the kind of numbers of sensors even if it's an R&D effort um, and I, so I, th I thought these images were powerful it did sh clearly demonstrate to people the kind of care um, that we take in controlling the environment. So there's one thing, the quality of the science that one has to do when you're doing biosensor development, but it's the control of the environment that you're working in as well is really important. I mean, when you see the way they're storing these, these sensors that are undergoing tests, they're all, you know, on Petri dishes covered up, you know, so we're, you know, and we're moving them around on trays, you know, so, um, you know, we're, we're taking really good care. And then when you look, at um, the way we're testing we have these multiple rigs where we can put lots of sensors um, all electrically connected and then we can go around and sort of pipette on the solutions you know so we have really um, industrialized let's say biosensor development and biosensor yeah manufacturing um, you know and this is th th this came from a research project but you know and what makes us very different Zimmer and Peacock is you know people go into these labs and we enjoy our work you know but day in day out we're doing this kind of stuff it's not like you know we're partly doing this and then we're off doing something else no no this is what we do you know we do the contract development contract manufacture of biosensors and you know we're doing it hopefully at a super high standard and that's why we can get the reproducibility um, in our work so 
Um, a couple of weeks ago, we changed the format for the video log and podcast. We went to this kind of live streaming um, forecast um, format, rather. I'm quite happy if people are going to follow us along on YouTube, etc. You can sort of drop a comment and you know um, get into a bit of a discussion, even as we're sort of essentially giving the um, or having this um, this vlog. So this week we put out some high quality data on the temperature characterization of glucose sensors. We put out some good quality data on you know how long a glucose sensor can run for. I mean you know it's 93 days so far and I wouldn't be surprised it could go to 365 days. Every Thursday 8 a.m. London time we have our ZP developer zone webinar um, and they're quite in depth um, so if you're technically interested or you're interested in biosensors and the technology then I would definitely recommend that. Um, if you're in Asia Zimmer and Peacock is talking at 9 a.m. Jakarta time this Tuesday um, on the commercialization of biosensors. Um, we've also got our webinar again for our developer zone on Thursday so don't forget that. Um, if you're one of the guys with the senior degree um, and you want to join Zimmer and Peacock, especially a lot of you who are um, outside of Norway in the UK, please take a serious look at this um, postdoc position that um, Eric at USN has offered. Um, it's a good university, he's got excellent facilities, he's a very good professor and you can have a very strong interaction with us whilst at that university and that's a probably a good way of um, being able to essentially get to know us better. And then lastly, um, you know, put those photographs up at the clean room just to give you a sense of Zimmer and Peacock. You know, it's you know we do a lot of contract development for people, and you know, and, um, you know these are valuable projects, and you know we don't do it um, in the open lab. No, we're doing it in clean rooms with you know really good protection. Um, and uh, you know we're not testing one sensor at a time it, we're testing 10 sensors at a time you know so we've made a real I mean it's fair to say that these multi-channel instruments that we have we have at least five of them um, and that we also have you know tens of single channel instruments so that's a summary of the news from Zimmer and Peacock so we've changed the format slightly now it's become a live webinar I do appreciate you know there's a small but hopefully growing audience um, you're welcome to um, drop comments in the YouTube chat as we go along and uh, if you have any questions reach out to us at Zimmer and Peacock but otherwise we'll be here next Sunday 8pm London time and yeah, look forward